Hi, hello, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County, Mississippi. And I am talking today about harvesting fruits and vegetables uh, in the home landscape. And really, of course, you know, that's an exciting time as a home gardener. There's a lot of the reason why some of us are attracted to growing vegetables at home is because what we can grow right in our backyard uh, is going to wind up being of a lot higher quality than what we might be able to get at a market. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to not only how we care for our vegetables and what varieties we grow, uh, but also comes down to how we're harvesting those vegetables. So uh, when we are you know, harvesting our own vegetables, when we're harvesting fruits and vegetables in our home landscape, we can pick those, uh, those products right when they're going to be at their peak quality. We can use them right away. And, and a lot of times commercially grown vegetables, because they need to be stored or because they need to be shipped, may be pick, picked before they're really at the point where, where they are the, the highest in quality. The classic example of that is tomatoes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Uh, but we, you know, I, I as a home gardener, uh, really never liked tomatoes growing up. I always thought they didn't taste very good uh, until I got started growing my own, and the difference really was night and day. Now, when we're talking about picking our produce at the point where it has the highest quality, uh, we need to understand that different plants and different vegetables and different fruits are going to be at that highest quality at different stages of ripeness. And so we're going to talk about individual vegetables or individual groups of vegetables uh, and talk about when we should harvest them and some, some good advice for uh, how we need to go about that. Uh, one kind of general note that is a really good idea is that almost every vegetable that we can think of is going to be best when it's harvested early in the morning. Uh, the temperature is still cool. It's still a lot more pleasant to be outside in the hot part of the year. Uh, and during the, the course of the day, the plant is going to wind up you, you know, losing a, a lot of its uh, moisture. It regains that moisture overnight. And during the nighttime, a lot of the starches that are being made by the plant get broken down and converted into sugar. So you wind up with a better tasting, crisper vegetable. Uh, now, when you harvest plants, you do want to keep them out of direct sunlight, keep them cool as soon as you possibly can, because as soon as we take that plant, that vegetable off of the plant, then it's possible that we can start to lose some of the quality of the vegetable. So uh, keeping them out of direct sunlight, keeping them in a cool area is really just going to help retain the quality of that vegetable for a little bit longer. Another thing we want to keep in mind is that, you know, when we're taking vegetables off the plant, we do want to be gentle with the plants. Uh, some vegetables are going to come very easily away from the plant. They're really easy to harvest by hand. Uh, but a lot of our vegetables, if they're, they're struggling to stay on just a little bit, uh, it's a lot better to use a tool to take them off. Uh, rather than twisting or pulling them, you can use a really good, sharp, clean knife. Uh, the kind of knife that I prefer, uh, there, there's no brand endorsement here, um, but I really like those Oppenel knives. I, I think they're really great for gardening. Uh, but you can also use a pair of harvesting uh, shears uh, or just a standard pair of pruners. Works really well to cut that stem without you know, having the potential of, of damaging the fruit as well as you know, not risking damaging the plant. Uh, so, uh, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we, we want to be out there harvesting uh, fairly frequently. Uh, part of that is because if we have mature fruit on the plant, then the plant says, you know, I've done my job. I've produced the fruit. I've got good seed that are, you know, getting, that are forming. Uh, so once that fruit's on there, the plant may stop production of flowers stop production or, or at least reduce production of other fruit. So by harvesting more frequently, we can wind up with a better harvest. Uh, 
and the, the, the rate or the frequency that we're gonna need to harvest those fruit is really going to depend uh, on the, the type of plant we're talking about as well. Uh, so just a, a kind of a quick note on what's going on with fruit ripening. Uh, a lot of species uh, of, of fruits and vegetables produce, when they're, when they're starting to ripen, uh, produce a chemical called ethylene. Uh, and that you know, produces a, a signal to the plant that basically tells the plant that it's time to ripen or tells the fruit that it's time to ripen. Uh, and having that ethylene present uh, leads to all sorts of biochemical things going on. Uh, so, uh, so some uh, enzymes are formed called amylases, uh, and those amylases result in the breakdown or the conversion of starch into sugar. Uh, so that's going to make the fruit sweeter. Uh, and you also get things called pectinases that break down the, the pectins, uh, which really kind of form the glue that hold the cells together. And so as the pectins break down, you wind up with a, a softer fruit. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on. Uh, you'll also, also see a, a breakdown of chlorophyll. Of course, chlorophyll is what's going to be giving that, uh, that, that fruit its green color. Uh, and so you know, with the loss of chlorophyll and, and sometimes the production of other pigments like anthocyanins, uh, that's going to lead to a change in the color of the fruit. So again, you know, you're going to wind up with a sweeter, fruiter, uh, uh, and softer fruit. Uh, and we also need to kind of pay attention, though, uh, that the, the natural process of fruit ripening isn't the only thing that can encourage that plant to start producing ethylene. Uh, and so when a fruit is damaged, uh, if we you know, have mechanical injury, uh, or if insects are feeding, or if a fungi is damaging the fruit, um, then oftentimes that's going to lead to the production of ethylene that causes that fruit to ripen. Uh, and it never fails for me. I'm walking through my garden. Uh, everything is green. It's still going to be a while. And I, I start to see a fruit uh, that, that's red faster than I, and I get really excited. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's either an insect or something else that's resulting in that, that fruit ripening faster than everything else. Uh, and generally, we just need to take those off and get rid of them. Uh, this injury or, um, or, or problem is also kind of where you, you get the, the phrase, one bad apple will, uh, will spoil the whole bunch. Uh, because if you have a damaged fruit, uh, in with uh, the rest of all of the other fruits and vegetables that we may be talking about, uh, it might be producing a lot of this ethylene. And because of that, all of the other fruit around can are influenced by that, uh, and it can cause spoiling with, uh, with the other vegetables. Uh, so when we talk about ethylene uh, sensitivity in fruit, we group our, our fruits and vegetables into two categories. Uh, and the two categories are climacteric and non-climacteric. Uh, so a climacteric fruit is sensitive to ethylene. Uh, when, we, when we harvest that, uh, that fruit will continue to develop to full physiologically mature, uh, physiological maturity even after we've removed it from the plant. And the kind of the classic example of this is bananas. Um, and so, even after we've taken that fruit off of the plant, it's still going to gain some flavor uh, because it's got starches that are already present there. Uh, that ethylene is going to help you know, have that fruit turn those starches into sugar. Uh, it's also possible that we are going to uh, have that fruit go from being firm into soft. Um, and they're, they're also sensitive to ethylene gas. So uh, if, if another thing is producing ethylene, uh, that's going to further aid the ripening process. And there are all sorts of uh, things with, you know, using bananas to try to ripen other things because bananas produce that, uh, produce that ethylene. Uh, now, what that really means for us is that climacteric fruit, we can leave those at room temperature. If we cool them very often, that, that transition, that, that further uh, maturation is going to slow down. Uh, so we can leave those fruit at room temperature until we, we're consuming them or until they get fully mature and then we can refrigerate them. So 
Uh, again, they're going to soften up, so that does make bruising them a little bit uh, a little bit more easy. So a lot of times, these types of fruit are actually harvested when they're physiologically immature, and then they're shipped that way. And so when the, the grocery store first gets those uh, bananas in, uh, they may be green, and then they continue to develop uh, until they're at the stage where we actually want to eat them. Uh, now, there are some types of fruit uh, that are what we call non-climacteric. Uh, they either don't produce very much ethylene uh, or they're insensitive to it, and there's, a, there's kind of a, some differences there. But once we take them off the plant, they are no longer going to mature. They're no longer going to gain any flavor or any sugar. The highest quality we are going to have for that product is going to be right at harvest. So um, just keep in mind that some of those non-climacteric uh, vegetables and fruits uh, are going to be sensitive to ethylene even if they don't produce it. Uh, so we, you know, we don't necessarily want to store those climacteric produce with non-climacteric non produce. So uh, you can see a chart there that I uh, shamelessly stole from somewhere. Uh, that uh, shows a uh, common climacteric and non-climacteric fruits and vegetables. Uh, and so you can see uh, apples as a classic example and bananas and uh, papayas and peaches are all climacteric. Uh, for the non-climacteric category, we have things like blackberries and cucumbers, uh, peppers, uh, raspberries and squash, strawberries, uh, quite a lot of things there. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're just going to start talking about some of the different vegetables and, and later some of the fruits uh, that we grow here in Mississippi uh, and talk a little bit about what we need to do to harvest them. Uh, so uh, beans are really popular, uh, really easy to, to grow, uh, very easy to grow trellised along fences and things like that. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, for the, the kind of beans where we're going to be, you know, harvesting the pods and then breaking them apart, uh, what we want to make sure of is that when we harvest them, the pods have kind of begun to bulge, uh, they're filled. The really easy thing to do to, uh, to check that is the seeds should actually be touching each other inside that pod. Uh, easiest thing to do because fortunately with beans you're going to have a, a whole bunch of them. You can open a few pods, kind of check where they are in terms of their, their uh, seed development, uh, and, and that gives you a really good indication for, for what you're trying to do. Uh, if you hold them on the plant too long, if they start to yellow, they're going to be over mature uh, and you're starting to lose quality. A lot of times like uh, lima beans are actually harvested a little bit immature uh, just to make them a little bit more tender. Uh, snap beans are a little bit different. We're keeping those in the pod. Uh, and so we want to harvest those when the pods are still tender. Uh, and before we can actually see the enlarging seed, uh, actually through the pod. Uh, so you should just see kind of a smooth outer coating of that pod. Uh, and when you take one off, uh, you can break it really easily and makes a really nice, good uh, snap when you do that. Uh, very similarly, we have peas, uh, garden peas. Uh, if we're shelling them, we just want to pick them when the pods are uh, firm, feel full. Uh, but again, before they begin to yellow, just keep in mind, you know, when we harvest these, we really need to do something with them pretty quick uh, because they are going to decline in quality fairly quickly. And if they're an edible pod type, uh, harvest them when you have the pod fully elongated, uh, but before the seeds get really big, usually that's going to be about a week after flowering. Uh, for southern peas, and that's going to be my, my favorite, black eye peas and purple hull peas. Uh, harvest them when the seeds begin to swell, but before they start to lighten in color uh, and start to dry out. Uh, very often, depending on variety, uh, that's going to be about 65 to 125 days. Uh, and you can use the immature southern pea pods uh, as snaps, and they are quite tasty. Uh, another personal favorite are peppers, and, and for me, it really doesn't matter if it's a hot pepper or a sweet pepper. Um, you can, uh, either of these, you can pick them green, uh, or you can allow them to ripen and change color on the plant. Uh, with hot peppers, occasionally, not, not something I generally do, uh, 
Uh, but if you hold that plant over all the way until the fall, you can just pull up the entire plant uh, and just hang the plant. You can let those uh, uh, peppers dry that way. Uh, jalapenos, you want to harvest them as the fruit turns a really nice dark black green. Uh, I always see uh, a few uh, what look like scratches on the outside of the jalapeno. Uh, for our sweet peppers, uh, and uh, usually when we're talking about that, at least down here in the southern part of Mississippi, uh, we're talking about bell peppers. Uh, you just want those to have reached full size. Uh, the fruit wall should be good and firm, kind of have that really nice. Uh, give to them, uh, and you're, you know, they're all going to start off green, uh, so you can absolutely pick them while they're green. Uh, if you allow them to stay on the plant a little bit longer, uh, then they'll ripen into uh, yellow or sometimes into red or orange. Again, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, that, that's going to be variety dependent, um, and those, those peppers that have ripened further on the plant, that have changed color like that, are going to have a lot sweeter taste than the green peppers. Uh, and I, I actually like to kind of do a mix of them uh, so that you get the, uh, the kind of mixture in the taste of that pepper. Uh, do keep in mind, pepper plants are, are really brittle. They, they break off very easily and it kind of never fails. If I'm trying to harvest peppers by hand, uh, I wind up breaking branches of them off and doing things that I don't want to do. Uh, so it's a really good idea to use a good sharp blade or a set of uh, clippers uh, to remove those peppers from the plant rather than just trying to pull or twist them off the plant. Uh, another uh, plant in the kind of tried to group these by their uh, by what broad group they're in. Uh, eggplant or is another really popular garden vegetable. Um, the easiest way to tell if an eggplant is uh, is mature and ready to go. Uh, is if you just kind of press slightly into it with your thumbnail, it'll leave that indentation there. And that tells you that the fruit has started to, to get soft and is kind of ready to go. Uh, size of that is, is you know, going to depend, be dependent on variety, uh, but you can really harvest them uh, once they're at a size that you like. You know, the, the fruit should be nice and shiny, should be uniform in color. Uh, again, you're going to want to use a good sharp knife to, uh, to take them off. Uh, the stems of eggplant uh, tend to be pretty sturdy, uh, so it can be a little bit of a struggle to get them to come off the plant. Uh, you just want to make sure you take them off uh, because uh, as the fruit really matures, uh, you start to get the, the flesh becoming tough, kind of woody, uh, and the seeds will harden. Uh, really makes uh, most of the applications that we use eggplant for a little bit unpleasant. Uh, now for the, the granddaddy of them all, the, the, the tomato, uh, and it's, uh, it's hard to talk about harvesting tomatoes without disagreeing with somebody. Uh, some people prefer to leave their tomatoes on the plant uh, until they are 100% ripe. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, they tend to get a little bit overripe if you do that, and uh, you just have more exposure to insects and other problems that you can have on the plant. Uh, my suggestion uh, would be to actually harvest your tomatoes uh, when they're uh, about 50% red, uh, still have a little, you know, they still have that blush color to them. Uh, the, pl the fruit has the starch in there that can be converted to sugar. Uh, and I don't think that the quality difference is that significant, but I understand some people I uh, do like to leave them uh, to, to completely vine ripen. Uh, you just want to make sure you take them off while they're still firm. Uh, it is important to note for your tomatoes, you know, what color they're going to wind up can, can vary pretty broadly, uh, depending on variety. So it's kind of a good idea to make sure you know the variety you're working with uh, and what that fruit's going to look like. Uh, if you do harvest your, your plants, uh, your, your tomatoes, just a little bit uh, green, uh, you don't want to refrigerate them. You want to put them up, put them in a, a nice cool area, about 70 degrees, uh, and they will continue to ripen there. Uh, you don't have to use any light. Uh, that's not necessary for their continued development. Um, and I, I generally tell people that it's a bad idea to put tomatoes in the refrigerator um, because that can just kind of reduce their flavor. Uh, and the tomatoes kind of get a mealy texture to them if they've been stored that way. 
Uh, another classic one is potatoes. Uh, I often get asked when potatoes should be harvested. Uh, and there's two answers to that, depending upon what kind of potato uh, you are trying to grow. Uh, if you want large potatoes, uh, you know, sort of the baking potato size, uh, then you want to harvest them after the vines have died back. Uh, you know, the tubers are there, they've taken in all that energy, uh, and that's kind of, they're kind of serving as the storage organ for the plant. Uh, and so you can dig them up. Uh, as you uh, as the plant has died back. Now, if you want new potatoes or early potatoes, um, you can you know after the plant is flowered, wait about two weeks, um, and you can just dig down in there and kind of find the potatoes um, and uh, give you a, and, and you know harvest them as you go, and you can kind of continue to harvest them um, as as long as they're you know whenever they get lo large enough to eat. Uh, with those large potatoes, uh, if you are uh, harvesting them, try to avoid scratching them or, da or, or uh, damaging them. Uh, and you don't want to expose them to light for too long. You don't want that green uh, forming on the outside of the potato. Uh, you fortunately can store potatoes for quite a long time. Uh, I've had some sitting in my kitchen, <laughs> sitting in an area of my kitchen now for about two months. They're doing just fine. Uh, just keep them in a dark, humid, kind of well-ventilated area, uh, and they'll store uh, for a fairly extended amount of time. Uh, summer squash, uh, one of the most popular uh, garden plants as well. Uh, harvest these, you know, the, the trick with harvesting squash is that you need to harvest squash frequently. Uh, if the growing conditions are good, if the plants are growing well, it, it's really good to get out there at least every other day uh, and check the development of those plants and see where those fruit are, uh, because we want to harvest them when they're the right size. Uh, we don't want the seeds getting big. We don't want the, the uh, flesh starting to get a little bit hard. Uh, so uh, they should still have a really nice, shiny, glossy appearance. Uh, you see that particularly in zucchini. Um, just a, you know, as a general size guideline, uh, a good crook neck or straight neck variety is going to be about an inch, you know, inch and a half to two inches in diameter, uh, and that's a good time to uh, to harvest it. Uh, zucchini is going to wind up being about seven to eight inches long, uh, and if you're growing scallop types, they're going to be about three to four inches in diameter. All of these can be harvested when they're smaller. We we harvest squash immature. And we use squash immature. Uh, and we want to make sure that we continually harvest the plants uh, because if we leave those large fruit on the plant, uh, and you'll occasionally see pictures of zucchini that look like they're the size of baseball bats, uh, leaving those large fruit on the plant kind of inhibits the development of additional growth. So we want to keep harvesting so that we can keep harvesting. Uh, very similar are cucumbers. Of course, there is a wide diversity in appearance <coughs> of cucumbers. Um, you can start harvesting them. We're about two inches long, up to just about any size, uh, but you want to kind of know the variety because after a certain point, uh, the seeds are going to start to harden, uh, the skin is going to start to turn yellow, and you want to make sure you harvest before that, unless, of course, you're harvesting one of the yellow cucumber varieties. Uh, if you're using a, a pickling type, you're generally going to have those between about two and six inches. Uh, the slicing or burpless types are usually picked between about six and ten inches. Uh, again, you need to pick frequently. You really need to check those plants every other day. Uh, and it's a good idea to use a, a good sharp knife for pruners because uh, it's relatively easy to damage the, the plant as you're trying to pull the, uh, the fruit away from it. Uh, kind of on the, the opposite side of the cucurbits, the winter squashes, and I'm going to include pumpkins in that. Uh, again, you kind of want to use a thumbnail test for that. They should have hard skin that you can't puncture with your thumbnail. Uh, that surface sheen is going to turn dull, uh, and the, the outside is going to look really dry. Um, in case of pumpkins, they're going to have a really nice deep orange color, unless you're throwing one of the weird varieties. Um, acorn squat, uh, squash, 
the spot contact in the soil is going to turn kind of orangish. Um, again, you know, cut away from the vine, leave a really nice stem there. Uh, try to keep them from getting wet, though it is perfectly okay to wash them off with soapy water. Uh, just allow them to air dry uh, and leave them that way until they're ready to use. I have seen some recommendations to, to use a dilute Clorox or bleach solution uh, to wash the outside of those fruit as well. Uh, of course, there, there's always a discussion about watermelons and how to get uh, uh, make sure that we get a ripe watermelon. Uh, as I was growing up, of course, I got taught the thump test uh, to uh, make sure that I was getting a good ripe watermelon. Uh, that is not a good indicator. Uh, and to be honest with you, every time they tried to tell, tell me the the sound for a ripe one and the sound for one that wasn't, I could never really tell the difference. Uh, so with a watermelon that we're wanting to harvest, uh, one thing that we can look for is the skin of that watermelon is gonna kind of lose its gloss. Uh, it's going to become a little bit dull. Uh, and we can look at the vine tendril closest to the fruit. Uh, and you can see a picture of it there. That vine tendril is gonna die down and turn brown. Uh, and we can look at the underside of the fruit as well. Uh, and that's going to have, you know, kind of, of course, it's going to have that spot where it's laying on the ground. Uh, and that's going to turn from white to kind of a, a nice creamy yellow color. Uh, and that's going to give you a good indication that that watermelon is ready to be picked. Uh, cantaloupe, the easiest thing for that is that uh, the, uh, the fruit will generally separate fairly easily from the stem. Uh, when these are ready to harvest. Uh, that surface netting is also going to turn kind of a beige color. Uh, the end of the blossom, which is the, the test that I really use, uh, is the blossom end is going to kind of get a little bit soft and will smell really sweet. Um, there, you know, there are some varieties that don't separate easily from the uh, stem, uh, but they do have that kind of color change uh, that we mentioned. All right, onions, uh, and we'll talk about onions and garlic here. Uh, of course, for green onions, just harvest them when the tops are the size that you want the tops to be. Um, six to eight inches is great. You just wanna make sure that you're not having the flower stalks form. Uh, it can change the, the taste of them a little bit, uh, but really you can just harvest them, you know, kind of by your convenience uh, when they're, you know, I like six to eight inches long, but you know, different heights are fine. Uh, for dry bulb onions, we want the, the tops to actually uh, to, to die back, uh, and about three quarters of the top should have fallen over. Uh, you want to, when you're harvesting, cut off all but about an inch to an inch and a half above the top of the bulb. Uh, air dry those uh, in a shaded area, uh, and then you can just store them in a well-ventilated place, and of course onions can last uh, a really long time in storage. Very similarly for, for garlic, um, they're going to be ready when you see those uh, leaves start yellowing down in the early summer. Uh, you can pull up the entire uh, plant by hand or use a spading fork, uh, trying not to bruise the bulbs. Uh, brush them off, but don't wash them. And you can let those, uh, again, uh, you know, leave them in a shady place with good air movement to dry out. Uh, and then you can uh, hang them in bundles. I've seen people braid them, do all sorts of fun stuff with them. Uh, I, I, I keep it simple. I just spread them out in a single layer on drying racks, uh, and that makes life fairly easy for me. Uh, just make sure when you're testing them, see if they're done, that the neck should be dry, outer skin should be papery. Uh, it could take two to three weeks. Uh, it's really humid here in Mississippi, so it's probably going to be towards the outside end of that. Uh, rutabagas and, and turnips are uh, really fairly straightforward. Uh, just harvest them. Uh, for rutabaga, it's about the size of a softball. Uh, for turnip, it's about the size of a tennis ball. Uh, if you harvest them early, it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, it's kind of a root product. They're just going to, you know, they're still going to taste just fine. Uh, you just may get a little bit less rutabaga and a little bit less turnip. Uh, if we leave them during the, in the ground, when it gets really hot, uh, they tend to get kind of pithy. They tend to develop a really strong flavor, uh, which I, I think might, I might rather term a really unpleasant flavor. 
so you generally want to harvest these before the temperature is going to get too high. Uh, kind of similar beets. Um, be honest with you, I just use the top of beets. Um, I, I like the beet greens uh, and harvest those. They, they work really well in stir fries and, and just cook like other greens. Um, I have never found a use for the uh, the bottoms that I uh, that I cared for, but you know, to each their own. Uh, harvest them when they're about an inch and a half to two inches in diameter. If you let them get bigger than that, they will turn woody, um, and uh, you don't want them to uh, to freeze in the ground. Fortunately, here at least in South Mississippi, uh, that is not a huge problem. Uh, but you also want to harvest the ones you plant in the spring uh, before we get hot weather again, because uh, we wind up with some off taste that way. Uh, carrots, uh, really a matter of just harvesting them when they're the size that we want. Uh, you know, different people will like that at different uh, different stages. We plant them in the fall and mulch them well. They can you know, be left in the ground, uh, used over the course of the winter, and just harvested them as, harvesting them as we want them. Uh, if we do take them out of the ground, one thing to note uh, is that it's a really good idea to go ahead and cut the tops off. Um, because if we leave the, the tops on, they are not going to be able to be stored quite as long. Uh, Brussels sprouts are one of my favorite vegetables, but one I have a real difficulty with in the garden. Unfortunately, uh, down here in the very south of Mississippi, it's very difficult to have a winter long enough to really get Brussels sprouts to grow. Um, I always like to take them to school groups because you can show that long stem with all the Brussels sprouts on it. Uh, and it is a frequent, um, uh, uh, you'll see it frequently on uh, lists on the internet that say, you know, you won't believe how this thing that you eat grows uh, because they grow off the side of that main stem. Uh, just harvest the sprouts individually. Uh, when they're firm, they're about an inch and an inch and a half in diameter. Uh, and start from the bottom of the plant and move up. And you'll see that kind of repeated uh, for a lot of this kind of vegetable um, uh, where we're harvesting from the bottom up um, because we have those mature, uh, you know, you know, the mature leaves in this case or buds in this case. Uh, and you know, they're, they're progressively younger as we move up the plant. Um, you can try to twist them off the stem. If they've gotten large, uh, you're gonna do a lot better with a, with a good knife uh, and, uh, and have a much better uh, product with a good sharp knife uh, than you will just trying to twist them off the plant. Uh, I'm just gonna group all the greens together because there's a whole bunch of them. There's turnip greens, mustard greens, uh, kale, collards, uh, spinach, and all sorts of other things that kind of fall into this category. Um, you can harvest the entire plant. We're, we're using the leaves, so you know it's okay to use the leaves at different stages of maturity. Uh, if you want to harvest the plant longer, though, you can break off individual leaves, starting with those mature leaves on the bottom, and then just move up over time. Um, of course, the young leaves, the, the new leaves up at the top are going to be a lot more tender, uh, and so you can harvest those as well. Uh, but if you just pick a few leaves at a time from the plant, it'll give the plant time to recover and you can keep harvesting uh, these, uh, uh, the, these vegetables uh, for a significant uh, period of time across your season. Uh, one little quick note that I learned from a, a farmer here in South Mississippi. Uh, of course, when I, uh, you know, when I think of collards, I, you, know, you always think of the leaf. And I would always cut away the stem uh, and uh, after I spoke with him and he, he demonstrated it for me and I tried it, uh, I now cut out those the mid ribs of those collards and actually use those as well. Uh, you can eat them just like a carrot. They're actually quite tasty. Um, so uh, maybe something that, that people haven't tried that, uh, that works well. Uh, kind of still in that same category of plants, we have broccoli and cauliflower. Uh, of course, for broccoli and cauliflower, now we're harvesting uh, the flower buds, essentially. Um, for broccoli, we want to harvest that when the head is three to six inches in diameter. Uh, what we really want to make sure of is that because it's essentially the, the flower buds, um, 
they have a tendency to start opening up and we want to make sure that we harvest them before those start to open up. It's really going to change the flavor of the, of the product. Uh, to harvest broccoli, just cut that main stem about six inches below the top of the head. Don't go ahead and pull the plant at that point uh, because a lot of varieties will actually produce secondary florets after that main head has been harvested away. Uh, cauliflower, uh, can be a little bit more of a struggle to grow just uh, because it tends to, to get some issues. Um, uh, but really rewarding, and I, I love cauliflower. Uh, there are two different types of cauliflower. There, uh, broadly, there's blanching varieties and, and non-self-blanching varieties. Um, if they don't self-blanch, and you just need to know what variety you have, uh, you need to tie up some larger leaves around that head right when that head first starts to appear and that's going to exclude sunlight away from it and protect the quality of that uh, cauliflower head. Uh, if it is self-blanching you don't have to do that. Uh, my recommendation is is to get one of those self-blanching varieties because it's just a, a task that you, uh, you, you can kind of eliminate just by variety selection. Uh, I just want to harvest the, the head should be firm six to seven inches in diameter uh, the, the sections of it shouldn't have started to separate. Uh, and generally, if you did have to tie it up, it's going to be about two weeks uh, for, uh, for when you're actually going to be ready to harvest. Um, do leave some leaves around the head, uh, you, it's kind of the same way you should get it at the grocery store, that's gonna help preserve quality. Uh, and just another note, we talked about greens right before this, uh, the leaves of broccoli and the leaves of cauliflower uh, taste fantastic. They work really well as greens also. So that's just another product that you can uh, you can use in the kitchen that you've grown in your garden. Uh, lettuces we break down into two different categories. Uh, there's head lettuces and leaf lettuces. Uh, head lettuces mature when it forms a head. Uh, just harvest the entire head by cutting it right at the soil line. Uh, leaf lettuce, you can harvest the entire head or just take those outer leaves. Uh, just be aware hot weather is going to make lettuce bolt really easily. Uh, but uh, you can use lettuce really at any size. Um, bib lettuce or romaine, you know, bib lettuce is going to kind of cup inwards. Uh, and romaine is, those leaves are going to start to overlap to kind of form a tight head. Uh, cabbage, again, just have a good solid firm head that's at the size you want it. Uh, there's going to be some differences in variety there. Uh, once you cut it though, make sure you get it out of the sun. Uh, cabbage, uh, once it's harvested, will kind of sun blister or, or just lose a lot of quality. So you want to harvest cabbage uh, and get it out of the direct sun as soon as you possibly can. Uh, sweet potato, uh, harvest them basically when the potatoes are uh, about three and a half inches in diameter. I haven't found a good way to do that in the home garden other than just kind of rough, you know, running your hand around there and trying to find them. Uh, cool soil temperatures can make them not quite as good. Um, it's a good idea to go ahead and remove the vines before you dig them up uh, and try to avoid handling them roughly because they can be damaged that way. Um, and you can, uh, you can kind of uh, keep them stored uh, where they'll heal some of that wound and, and they'll still convert a little bit more starch into sugar. Uh, just place them in a good warm room. Usually that's going to be in the kitchen. Leave them there for about two weeks. Uh, if the temperature's below 70, they, they're not gonna progress. Uh, and you don't wanna keep them below 50 degrees. So usually our homes are, are gonna be in that range, uh, you know, just above the 70s. So they'll develop a lot more flavor two weeks after they've been harvested. Sweet corn, uh, the husk should still be green. Silk should be dry and brown. Uh, it's gonna be the little threads that come out the top. Uh, kernels should still be plump and tender. Uh, and the thing about sweet corn is it really starts to decline in quality the moment you harvest it. So you want to either eat it fresh or store it uh, as quickly as possible after harvest to have a really good tasty sweet corn. Uh, asparagus, is, asparagus can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you do need to wait about three years to harvest it. Um, you can cut spears about six to eight inches long, just snap them off or cut them right below the soil line. Uh, don't cut too deep because you can damage buds. 
Uh, and if you allow it to get more than six, eight inches long, the base is going to get really hard uh, and you'll have to cut that off again. But, you know, aim for about six to eight inches and, and you should be in good shape. Uh, okra, uh, harvest them when the pods are about two to three inches long, really need to be harvested every other day um, because having pods on the plant will uh, inhibit flower growth or flower production. Uh, and be gentle with them. A really good idea to use a set of pruners uh, on these. Really hard to get those okra off there. They'll, they'll mess up your fingers. Uh, and the okra pods bruise easily. So using a good sharp tool is going to help you keep them, uh, keep them in good quality. I just want to spend a few minutes talking about different, uh, uh, some, some of the fruit trees we grow. Uh, and a lot of times what we're looking for on fruit is what we what you'll occasionally hear is ground color or background color. Uh, and that is going to be the color on the skin uh, of the fruit on the side that's not exposed to the sun. So if you can look at it, you know, under a nearby leaf or look at it on the side facing the tree, what we're looking for uh, is going to be uh, you know, usually those immature fruit have a, a nice dark green color, uh, and that background color that, that's not blushed like the rest of it uh, is going to turn from a green to a greenish yellow to a yellow, uh, and in some cases it'll turn orange when it's a little bit over mature. Uh, another really good indication of fruit maturity uh, is that the fruit's going to come off the tree relatively easily. Uh, if you look at the end of a stem on a pear or on an apple, you can kind of see an end of that stem uh, where there's a clear area where something was going on with the plant there, and it's called the abscission zone. Uh, and there are some specialized cells there uh, that respond to the changes in fruit maturity. Uh, and then when the fruit is mature, the cells start to break down, and that allows the fruit to naturally kind of separate away from the tree. And so a mature fruit should be able to pull off that tree without a, without a big struggle. Uh, of course, you can use smell or aroma. Uh, one of the, the farmers here in uh, South Mississippi uh, uh, talking about flowers says that uh, you know, some things have a smell, but roses that he grows have an aroma. So I try to use the right word. Um, you know, as the fruit ripens, it's going to start to produce all sorts of volatile compounds that give that fruit that fresh, ripened smell. Uh, of course, with some fruit, you know, if you have something like muscadines, you can just try one uh, and, and use taste as a method to uh, determine ripeness as well. Uh, and often the, the firmness of the flesh uh, is a really good indication too. Uh, you know, we go back to the, the pectinases that are breaking down uh, that, that you know, kind of glue between the cells. Uh, so as the fruit ripens, it's going to get a lot softer. Uh, that reduction in some fruits going to be relatively slow. Apples and pears are still pretty hard. Uh, some of them, things like peaches and plums, uh, are going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be able to use firmness as a really good indicator of maturity. Uh, so for apples, uh, of course, you know, down here in South Mississippi, again, this can be a little bit of a struggle, but uh, ground color, you know, we're looking at that area uh, away from the, uh, the sunlight, uh, away from that reddish blush. Um, if it's a red fruited apple, just look at the side that faces the interior of the tree. Uh, when that ground color starts to change from leaf green to a lighter pale green, uh, then the apples are ready to go. Uh, if it's a yellow apple cultivar, that color is going to become a little bit more golden. Uh, and you can use that as an indicator. Um, mature apples, if they have a yellowish green uh, background color, we're not going to be able to store those. Uh, they will generally improve if we store them uh, when they're hard but mature. Uh, so other thing you can check if you want to sacrifice one is you can cut the apple in two. Uh, you can look at the seeds there. Uh, and if the seeds have turned brown uh, on most apple cultivars, that will indicate they're ready to be harvested. Uh, for pears, we definitely want to, we don't want to keep them too long on the tree because they turn mealy uh, if they've, uh, uh, if we leave them on that long. Uh, tree ripened fruits, generally speaking, are going to have kind of a soft brown center, uh, not going to be able to be kept as long. 
Uh, so we want to pick them when they're still hard and and ripen them after they after they're harvest. Excuse me, harvested. So uh, you know, harvest them. They should still be firm, but the ground color should have lightened to a pale green. Another thing that you can use is that pears have little spots on the surface of the fruit. Uh, those are called lenticels, uh, and they're whiter green on immature fruit, but they, they turn brown as the fruit ripens. So you can use that as a good indication uh, that the pears are ready to be harvested. Uh, peaches uh, may actually be ripening before they start uh, get to full size. Uh, ground color de uh, development, that same background color we were talking about, uh, is really going to be the best indicator to show you that they're ready to go. Uh, of course, uh, softening is, is going to happen first. That tends to start on the blossom end. Uh, and generally speaking, our peaches on the top and the outside of the tree are going to mature first. Plums uh, really just use fruit color and softness. Flavor is the, uh, the real recommendation there. Just try one of them, see how they are. Um, but they should be ready when the flesh has started to soften. Uh, and if it'll yield to a little bit of pressure of your thumb, that's a good indication as well. Uh, of course, down here in South Mississippi, we can grow some citrus. And uh, if you've got a protected place or you do it in pots, you can do it in North Mississippi as well. Uh, generally speaking, with citrus, we will see a color change from green to orange or yellow. Uh, those, you know, if we start to see the fruit, the skin of that kind of wrinkling or being loose, generally a sign the fruit's been left for a good long time on the tree. Uh, but really the best method to determine whether citrus is ripe or not uh, is just to give one a try. Uh, and, uh, and usually, fortunately, we have uh, quite a lot of fruit on one tree. Uh, so sacrificing one to give it a taste uh, is, a, is a good enough method to use. Uh, of course, figs are another one. Uh, I do want you just kind of a quick note that very frequently with figs, we're competing with birds and other wildlife when we're trying to harvest them. Um, so, you know, sometimes we do, we might want to try to put a net over them to protect them. Uh, but color change and firmness are, are going to be your indicator for ripeness on figs. Uh, really quickly, uh, just to talk about storage temperature, not all produce is going to be stored at the same temperature. Uh, I've got a chart for you that, that will show you kind of where we, where we want to be. Higher temperatures can cause them to mature or spoil, uh, spoil too quick. If the temperatures are too low, we can see killing injury. Uh, I have received pictures of zucchini that were in somebody's refrigerator uh, that just look kind of like you see in the picture there. Uh, and those temperatures were just too low in the refrigerator and actually damaged the, uh, damaged the produce. Um, so you can see that in off color or bl bland flavor, uh, the fruit's not going to look very appetizing uh, or have kind of a frozen look to it. Uh, most of our in-home refrigerators tend to be set to about 35 or 40 degrees. Good idea to check that if you've got a thermometer um, because you'll find different areas of your refrigerator tend to stay different temperatures. Uh, so I'm not going to go into this too heavily. I just wanted to include this so that you had that from the notes uh, that you can get on the Google Drive. Um, uh, this is just kind of a quick way. Uh, to show you uh, kind of a, a lot of information about what the ideal storage temperature for different vegetables and fruits would be, uh, as well as you know, sort of humidity conditions uh, and whether they're ethylene sensitive or not, because again, we don't want to store things that are ethylene sensitive with things that are not. Uh, so I appreciate your time today, and I will be very pleased 